Hi, on Parenting in the Trenches today, we're talking with Candace Thomas about perinatal mental health and about not just our personal experience of mental health around uh, parenting and birthing, but also how our system exists right now across Canada in particular, but I think there's some common commonalities about how people experience this around the world. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we go forward from here and close gaps in our mental health care. It's an important conversation. And uh, from what I have learned from Candace so far is that she carries both the passion, the activism and the personal experience that it takes to really firsthand understand the work and what is required to do better. Uh, so I'm always excited about conversations that hold that thread to it. Candace is the owner of Evergreen Wellness Studio in, uh, in downtown Barrie, Ontario. She's a registered massage therapist and certified athletic therapist. She has been helping her clients reach their wellness goals for over a decade. She has spent the early years of her career traveling and working with professional athletes and has now found her true calling, working to bridge the gap between mental and physical health. Through her own journey with anxiety, depression, and postpartum, Candace has become a fierce and outspoken advocate for mental health and perinatal mental health reform in Canada. Candace has two beautiful daughters, Olivia and Ada, and she's motivated by the lack of resources for mothers struggling with postpartum. Candace founded the Live More Project, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Please check that out to help raise awareness and funds for mental health programs within her community. Candace, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. We're going to talk about perinatal mental health today, and from, both from a personal and a systemic perspective. So I'm really grateful that you are the one having this conversation with me. And could we maybe start out because I, people, anybody who listens to this regularly knows that I often open with lived experience is incredibly important. And so that's what I value that it's not just our professional experience, but it's the lens of what we've lived through and what we've learned from that. So could you kick us off today, just sharing a bit about your own journey of, around mental health and birthing and parenting and what that looks like for you? Oh gosh, that's such a small topic. Yeah. 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 (laughs) No sweat. But we'll start with that. We'll start with that. My mental health journey, actually, it only started, I only started seeking help. um, I would say maybe 10, 12 years ago, but knowing what I know now, for sure, I've struggled for much longer than that, probably mm. as a child and a teenager and so on. Um, but uh, just my struggle with anxiety and depression mm. eventually brought me to the point where I met with a psychologist and she brought me into a mindfulness-based stress reduction course. And at okay. first, it was like, Hey, it's going to be a group. It's going to be so fun. I'm like, Oh, I don't want to be in a group of people talking about Uh my things. Mm -hmm. That is strange. And she's like, just try it. You never know. Right. You never know. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh And that was probably 11 years ago or so. And being in a group of people that have the same sort of struggle and worries and fears as you finally made you see like I'm not alone in this this is so nice to sit next to someone that understands exactly what I'm trying to say because so often we say things and sometimes people just don't understand what's going on in our minds yes they can't kind of wrap their heads around it unless they've gone through it or they're feeling it themselves so from there Um, I've been very diligent in terms of implementing Mm -hmm. mindfulness strategies into my everyday life. Um, And I thought had it all together when I got pregnant the first time. Um, Olivia was a surprise, Mm -hmm. a wonderful surprise. But um, with that birthing experience, I moved two hours from my hometown, my whole family, Mm. and we're very close to family. So just right Mm -hmm. there, my support system was kind of taken away a bit. And uh, 
so that birthing experience was a struggle. I think I thought I had coping skills and that whole, um, that whole experience just kind of blew any skills mm-hmm. I had out of the water. I had, mm-hmm. I feel like I was drowning a bit and then having, giving birth in 2020 to my daughter, Ada in a pandemic, I don't think anything could have got us ready for that. So mm-hmm. yeah, I would say I was glad that I had some sort of base and, um, I have, I'm a very strong willed person. I am very outspoken. So that has helped for, uh, in terms of my self advocating, Yeah. but nothing prepared me for 2020 at all. Yeah. No. And I, I would, I would think, and I don't know if this is your experience, but I've experienced this myself where you think you're really well resourced and you can take mm-hmm. on anything. Cause in the moment you're actually, you're thriving, you're doing quite well. and and it, it's, yeah, stuff goes out. Like it it feels like it's gone out the window, but it almost just feels like it's just not enough. Like it's still there and it's probably still running your engine somehow, but it can't like you're behind the eight ball. Like you just can't catch your breath the same way. Cause the it's just overloaded. Yeah. That is a hundred percent true, especially right now. And I'm sure a lot of people feel that same way. It's hard to kind of catch up or catch your breath there's not a moment to stop and even look inward you're so busy minded thinking about what's coming next and the fear that because we don't know what's coming next Mm -hmm. that is just yeah it's been a lot yeah it's a not (laughs) nice game for our own nervous systems and our brains to be chronically undergoing this um effort to prepare with very little data about what we're preparing for, but you can't just stop preparing. Right. So it's not like we can just throw our hands up and go, Oh, well, what comes comes. I mean, realistically, if you're parenting, you have to be somewhat prepared. So you're always primed to try your very best to be prepared. And this has been a season, a two year season of not ever really knowing what we're fully preparing for. So inevitably we get to the point where we're hit with something and we have this repeat experience of being underprepared, even though we've put in our, all our best efforts. Hey, yes, a hundred percent. And I, as a parent, what I do is if I'm prepared, I feel like that takes away some layer of stress. I know that I'm ready for such and such and such, and my kids are prepared and, you know, going back to school shopping and things like that. It's in our nature to prepare. So it's less stress when that time comes. And with this, it's just kind of, you're bobbing and weaving and trying to make the best out of this crazy situation, which is not natural for anyone. I had a good friend who was scheduled to, uh, well scheduled, it didn't turn out to be a C-section section. So she was going, she gave birth and I, you know, the whole preparation was she was told she could only have one person in the room. Mm, And so she had asked me, uh, and I've never given birth. So, you know, I'm not sure if she was choosing the right person, but she asked me to (laughs) be that person to show up at the, at the hospital when she gave me that last minute call and then it got kiboshed and she couldn't have me in there and I was just thinking like I can't out of all the things that I've had to pivot that birthing alone just seems like nope that crosses a line that is like a (laughs) no no. unimaginable no I couldn't imagine such I couldn't imagine such a thing because your brain in that moment is, is, is here, there and everywhere, especially if, it, if it's your first pregnancy, I could not yeah. imagine the thoughts running through your mind and you're yeah. trying thinking, I have my birth plan. I have my birth idea. That's right. I'm going in, you know, people do the hospital tours so they can at least yep. like visually see. I know I definitely did that. Yep. So I couldn't imagine getting there and someone telling me that what my, what I had my sight set on, it was just not possible. It's not going to happen. It would be such a blow in a time that I'm supposed to be very mentally focused. Yeah. I I don't get it. And yet here she is thriving on the other side. Woo. Yes. Miracle. Yes. (laughs) Today we, thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate you sharing some of the personal journey for you. Um, and we'll probably 
weave in and out of that as we talk about the other things of, of assist from a systemic lens, but how you experience the system as well on a personal level. So I love how we've kind of constructed today's topic because the title that you so eloquently chose to kind of capture this was where do we go from here? And I love two things about that. One, I love that there's the word we, not you. And Uh also that from here, that there's some hope and preparation and advocacy we can do and work that we can actively participate in to close the gaps of mental health care for new moms in particular. Yes. So can you maybe start from a personal lens, moms who are listening, parents who are listening, expecting parents who are listening from a personal perspective, what can they be thinking about from a mental health lens about what are my next best steps to taking good care of my mental health? Well, I, well, I'm sure you and I have both heard the term self-care quite yeah. often. And we heard it a lot when the pandemic, <laughs> yeah. say, oh, so oh. every time I hear it, I'm like, Ooh, I always want to just, clarify that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. To me, it means uh, you're giving yourself permission to do something for yourself, but you only get this little space to do that. And it just, it, it, that's not living. You can't live in this, these tiny little moments. It's not fair because you need those moments through a lifespan you can't just be happy in these little blips that you mm. just are so lucky to have. Yeah. So self-care to me is I'm more about creating little steps that turn into a lifestyle, okay. not for yourself, but for your family. Um, so I'd say from a mental health lens is if you are, if you are going to be having a baby, setting up things that are outside of baby, a mm. baby shower is for a baby right? Think about it. All the gifts are for baby. And everyone asks you, is it a boy? Is it a girl? How are you feeling? How is baby, you know? And then when baby's here, I always picture in my head, a mom sitting, holding their infant and everyone comes around and takes baby and, and goes the other way. And mom is sitting there yep. just trying to, I don't feel good in my body or I feel uncomfortable or I have pain. I'm not sure what I'm doing. All of these questions taking care of yourself and, and figuring out what can you set up ahead of time that's going to make you successful later because you as a success means baby, yeah. means family. Because we start here, right? You yeah. start with mom and go down, not baby and go down. It's You can't pour from this empty cup anymore. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And I think even just something as as, as small as, lactation consultant Mm -hmm. going back to what you said about your friend when I went to the hospital I with my first pregnancy in 2016 I thought you just have a lactation consultant right it makes sense I don't know you have a baby in the maternal no no they didn't have a budget for a lactation consultant anymore so it doesn't Mm -hmm. exist at that time so I went in thinking they're going to help me learn how to do this and Mm -hmm. I went home not knowing anything So I already felt defeated. I think trying to figure out things to do beforehand are so important for the successes after. Um, From a mental health standpoint, especially have your support system. And I know from comparing, because we were talking before about my first and second pregnancy and how different they were. I thought I was very well prepared for my second Mm -hmm. Turns out there's no way I could have prepared to be that isolated in the middle of a pandemic. No one kind of knew what to do or how to react. Um, So trying to find things now, if you are pregnant, you have kids at home now, what is it that you need right now? What are your support systems look like right now? Does it look like a Zoom call? Does it look like every Friday night I have a talk with this person or I have this set time that I do this for myself every single day. And maybe it's something you do as a whole family. Um, Cause I think if you do it for yourself, it kind of, again, trickles down to everybody else. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I always say, well, as a parent, we were just talking about making a plan yeah. and I know plans change every day. You might sleep in, you might have a bad morning. You might not get any sleep. 
So I understand that, but let, allowing yourself to just kind of flow through the day. You, we've got to a point where we don't have a choice. We've, I feel personally, I'm trying to fight this flow of why do yeah. I have to live this ground, groundhog day every day of yes. doing the same things I don't want to do. But once I let go and I just said, I'm going to wake up and just kind of flow through my day, mm-hmm. it, it, I felt less resistance and okay. less disappointment or less anger. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, me, we can't Karen, compare. I can go on and on. I love this though, because no. we can't compare to our previous experience. I think that's torture. We're thinking yes. as though we are the same resourced person that we were before all the added layers hit us and yes. anything that comes as a, as a surprise or restricting or withholding for us, we don't shift our mental expectation of us. And so we can't, we don't get the experience. We can turn our wheels a hundred times as fast. And we have this assumption that then we'll get back the experience. That's okay. And it actually is because we're, it's external limitations. Like we're not yes. working with a fully resourced kit that we thought we were no. going to right? And that's pandemic, but that's also when we're surprised by our decline in mental health. After we give birth, we're primed to think the baby's going to arrive. This can be wonderful. And people will rally and we've got so much to celebrate. And I'm going to have a nine month mat leave and I'm going to, we have visions and maybe not so, so like fully sugar coated. We've got some realistic expectations too, but I think in general, we're hopeful and we want it to be positive. And so we go in with that and we don't know what will happen in the delivery room one month later we don't know. And so many people's experience in the last while has been disappointing and harder than they thought. And they blame themselves because I was going to be the happy mom. Right. Right. I was going to get it all done and I was going to do things. I'm going to want to see my kids every second of the day. That's right. No, no. And then well, you and I talked about all of these layers and mm-hmm. mom guilt is such a huge layer. And we, I'm sure we could do a whole episode about yeah. that, but I'm finding now moms have so many decisions to make. The decision fatigue is overwhelming, mm-hmm. but the decisions in their minds are like, I'm trying to make the best decision for my child. There's, yeah. I don't even know if there's a right one. And, and I'm, I'm hoping it all turns out well for them. And just, just that alone, the constant, should I, shouldn't I, if I do this, am I a bad mom? If I do this, am I a good mom? It just, it's another layer and a layer and a layer. And it's so, it's been exhausting, I think, for a lot of people. It's the Mm -hmm. mental load. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people are familiar with that term. I do see it on, you know, social media quite a bit these days, but I don't know who it's really reaching, but it's such a good capture. The mental load is invisible. It's all the automatic things that we think don't take a lot of effort. But when we really dissect it, we realize that feeding your kids a snack every 20 minutes of the day, because that's what they keep asking for, comes with a burden that people don't realize, us included. We don't realize the amount of executive functioning that goes into that, the amount of pre-planning and thinking that we don't get to feed our kids their picky exact amounts and color of food on the right plate. If we haven't thought to already go get those things, we are constantly thinking this through in micro moments. And that is a mental load. And then you take that template. You could put that on anything for parenting. It is not just, Oh, my kid wanted a snack and I delivered. It is all the stuff around it. Yes. Right. Driving, taking two kids to the grocery store to yes. get this thing that they requested. And it's just, rah, rah, rah. but I, what we were taught, as, as you just said, that I'm not sure who sees that, the mental load. If someone has, is listening to this and it's like, oh yes, I've heard this. Mm. The people that I think need to see it, don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that good call. Right. I, I, which is very unfortunate. So you could tell a mom, you and I could say the mental load and we'll both nod our heads. Yes. Mm. But I could go home and say to my husband, like, this is a real mental look. And he'd be like, 
what is that about? You know, it's, yeah. and, and I relate this to my first pregnancy, mm-hmm. my first doctor's appointment. Um, they did the pregnancy test that came in. Oh, you're pregnant. Congratulations. This is very exciting. And they handed me, I still have it. It's this giant folder of what to expect, all the lists of things, you, vitamins you need to take, why you need to take them, where you need to be, when you need to be there, foods you should eat, foods you should not eat, how much you should be sleeping, all this stuff. And you know, they, they handed my husband a pamphlet. It was this <laughs> three page and the front of it was how and to it be begins. a good dad. Oh, right. Uh, I was shocked. I'm still shocked. I saved the two of them just so I could like hold them up and say like, remember, Uh and that is really frustrating because I feel like it's setting up a a partner to fail. Thank you. Amen. Because if, right. I don't, if you don't give it to both of us, you give it to one of them, then there, there's your setup. Yes. And not only that, now I have this huge folder. I have to now read it, digest it and explain it to my other half yeah. when really we should be in the same conversation. And I see it often when I went to the pre and postnatal classes, hmm. especially, so I'm trying to do baby led weeding with yeah. Olivia discussing foods and like, do you really puree chicken? Is that gross? I don't know. I don't know. I have these questions, Ugh. but and, it's so gross. Right? <laughs> So I, you have all these questions and you're thinking, oh my gosh, do I have my updated CPR? I don't know. The infant choking is a big deal. So see, you and I are talking about this mental load. You can hear the conversation going on in my head, but I feel like, why aren't these things including partners? Why isn't this from the ground up being built that we do this together, yeah. right? I come to work and it's, well, if you're here, who's watching your kids? <laughs> the other parent, or you have all of these TV shows, it's, you know, working moms, you would never hear this is a show called working, working dads. dads. Hey, you're, you're, <laughs> you're a, you're a working dad. Right. But I think society really builds it. If you even look at Instagram, they it's, or our Facebook or any social media, parenting is so glorified. Birthing is so glorified. We, we post all these beautiful family photos you and I both know there's Mm -hmm. such a, such a hard space for a mom. And, and I I feel like it looks like this is our job and we should do very well on this job and it should be Instagram worthy. Yep. And if not, you're not doing a good job. You are not doing right. Not the case, right? Uh, So what do we do about that? What do we do? Okay. Let's talk about what what do we do, right? Where are the gaps? So, I mean, I'm already brainstorming. You talk about that. I've never entered a a room for birthing prep where both parents are attending. I have no idea what that, you know, I mean, I've seen what that should look like, but it's so, it makes it look as though like you're already asking dad to show up or partner to show up as a supportive figure not as a partnering figure, a supportive, yes. you're behind, you're holding your, and good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. You took your kids right? to the park. Just good look job. at you showing up. Right. When I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And what the real experience is, we don't even understand what it should and could look like. So when you describe that discrepancy and that inequity, I think, man, just given giving pamphlet versus binder to who like the, what, what messaging that is and how strong that is. And from an authority figure Uh is either reinforcing what's already believed or just not challenging it. And how different that would be if somebody vocalized, you're going to need to be fully informed together as partners in this the two of you need to be looking through this full binder and deciding for yourselves what your plan's going to be to support each other, yes. to support your family. What a difference already from a systemic yes. perspective of doctors were trained to speak that way. How different yes. that would be. 
And that's That's one tiny thing. So you take the train on this. Tell me what else we can put in the cars of that train. Like what, where else, where should we be looking for system change? Oh boy. From beginning to end. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I often, I, um, I often think I wish I could, I wish I could do a survey of if you had to describe even just getting pregnant all the way to post your first year, your child's first birthday, where in the, in there did you find gaps? And I'd love to chart it to see where most people found those big gaps, because we know there is a lot of, well, now postpartum and depression is just skyrocketed beyond. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I'm sure those gaps are even highlighted, but thinking about trying to say, well, we, you really need to have your partner, be your partner, be this person. It's the same person, but because of the pandemic, Mm -hmm. you can't even bring your partner into your ultrasound. You can't even, I, with Ada, I couldn't bring my partner to anything. So even if he wanted to come, he couldn't come. So I, it's done such a big disservice because now mom has to go home and you're hoping at that ultrasound you get good news. Could mm-hmm. you imagine getting bad news and you're by yourself? Yeah. It's just traumatizing. It's, it's traumatizing. And I think this pandemic has highlighted to the max, the gaps. So it's allowed everybody to see, wow, we yeah. needed something and it wasn't there when we needed it the most. And like you and I were discussing before, I wouldn't really like to say it's a silver lining, but to look at it as I knew so many people, including my own mother, that I would say like, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I, there's something wrong with me, mm. there's something not happening up here for me, I don't understand my own brain, yeah. I don't know why I feel sad all the time, now, because of this pandemic, you have, everybody has been touched in some yeah. way with depression, anxiety, fear, lack of sleep, it's, it's almost like everyone's through the first six months of being a new mom mm-hmm. like this <laughs> like mm-hmm. the online school all of the new challenges I feel like now is the best time to say okay because this is so highlighted where are the gaps how do we fill it so I I would say systemically it may be a two a two person thing mom and partner both need to be involved in these steps from getting pregnant to going to appointments to seeing results and ultrasounds and things like that. And then I would have loved to have someone come into my room after delivery and ask me, how are you doing? They don't, right? Like now Mm -hmm. it's it's very much way baby, you know, Mm -hmm. make sure baby's okay and Mm -hmm. hand it to you and see you later. I would have loved to have someone come in and they do have forms. I did fill out a form. Would you like Um, someone, a social worker to speak to after, do you have history of mental health? Yes, 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 yes. Did I ever see anyone? No. Was I ever contacted after? No. And it's been almost six years. I still from my first, right? No follow through. There's no follow through there. And if you're a mom right now, that's the last thing on your list, right? Like it's sad. It shouldn't be but it really is, it is like yeah. asked for, you've asked for help and it didn't show up when it said it would show up. And that is just, it's not fair. We've done yeah. our part. We've gone the halfway and we need to be met the system the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. And I think from the moment you deliver, there should be someone there to support you and say, here is, here's where you can go. And, and I would be there. That's right. Like, if someone yeah. gave you a, a bunch of papers, like here's a list of numbers that you could call and good luck with that. Yeah. You would feel like, oh, I'm great. It's Just all add on that to my... Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I would want to, to, to kind of take over that care. And, and if I ask my friends, I have at least 50, 50 friends that had went with their OB friends that went with midwives and doulas okay. and both great. My experience was amazing with my OB. But when I asked my friends, why did you choose a midwife or a doula Mm -hmm. over an OB? Oh, I feel more supported. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm being heard. And they come and see me after. And in my head, I'm like, shouldn't that be the norm? It should be. Yeah, that's right. And remember, at one point, you had to choose. You couldn't have an OB and a midwife. 
Now you can. <sighs> okay. Right. You have to pick one or the other. Mm-hmm. And so it's just, it, it seems like what we're saying is I don't feel supported. I'm not being heard. And even when I, I have the guts to say, please help me. Someone t- turns around and says, okay, get in line. That's right. Get in line. It's probably a one-year waiting list, two-year yep. waiting list, but someone will hear you down the road. So things like that cannot happen. Our help cannot be later. It needs to be now. And from giving birth in pandemic versus in 2016, mm-hmm. the healthcare system has not changed. The mental health system has not changed. How is it that you have working mothers are trying to work, work from home, work at work and then go home or split up their time between their kids, juggle their spouse time with their spouse, if any, have a social life of some kind, you know, how do you expect to add all of this and not have any added help? It's, it's just, I know it makes you feel like, okay, we know the problems, Candice, you're telling me something Mm -hmm. I already know. What comes next? Yeah. I think me is, we, we talked about this before, the barriers. Okay, tell me what are the barriers? Why aren't these people showing up for us in the hospital post-care? And why is it such a long waiting list? Public health care, right, is if we did things faster, it would cost. So then there's a financial barrier for sure. Yeah. And that would be for a lot of people. And that's not fair. We shouldn't be punished mm-hmm. or have to wait for adequate care just because you can't afford it. Um, I think there needs to be some sort of programs developed that are either either provincial or federal. It'd be lovely if it was federal, yeah. but even starting out here, okay, you get this, you get so much money and we're, or we'll publicly fund this system and we'll make multiple of them. So that way it's not just we have one place you could go for care and everybody goes to this one place That's right. and hope Funnel. for the best. Yep. Yes. And um, as an athletic therapist, massage therapist, treating patients, if I fell and I broke my arm today, I know without even asking, I wouldn't even need to Google it. I would immediately go to the ER and say, my arm is falling off and they would help me. They would, you wear a cast and here's some Tylenol. And I'll see you in six to eight weeks. Yes. And then after that, you go to physio for six to eight weeks. And ta-da. So I've had so many moms come in and say, so where did you go after you had a baby? Like this like, mystery. Ask? Is there a book? Oh, yeah. it's that's so wrong because there's yeah. so much out there. And just trying to research, you don't know is this right for me? Is this, I should be looking at, I think the same way we treat physical pains, you should have the same. It should be just the same for mental pains. I should know exactly what I need to do without even hesitating. Oh, I go Mm -hmm. here and this is how they help me. And this would be my protocol after I had a friend of mine. She called me last summer in the middle of like, Oh, it was crazy pandemic wise. And she has a young daughter who struggled with anxiety and depression before. And she says, she's having a panic attack. And can you help me? I, can you tell me where to go? Who do I talk to? And I, 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 in my head, I'm like, well, I'm trying to think of, because of my journey, I've yeah. met people here and there. And I have these resources of people to refer yeah. my patients to or friends. who have created this system to help others. But in that moment, I thought, how sad is that? This mm. poor mom just wants to help her child and can't and has no idea. And you don't want to look at your child and not know what to do because yep. now they're looking at you saying that you don't know what to do. That means there's no place for me somewhere, right? Yeah. That's devastating. Yeah. So she ended up to the ER because there's no one, <laughs> there was no one working on a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. I was just right? Yeah. It's just, so the difference, I, the, the fundamental difference sounds like who's initiating and responsible for initiating follow-up care. Mm-hmm. So in other systems that are more physical care as the primary goal, those have been prioritized and set up for the most part. 
If you're going to get a cast, Mm -hmm. they right away tell you when you leave, you're going to come back here in six weeks. and going to assess if it's ready to come off. Then you're going to go to physio. This is the plan. Here's your one page pamphlet. You are not getting that for mental health care. And what we know is that early identification and intervention is key to our survival and wellness, right? That things don't sit with us for years before we get help because that sinks in, changes our, reshapes our thinking. It reshapes our nervous systems. It reshapes our relationships and our structures in life. If we intercede early, we know people do way better. And we don't have a yes. system that reaches out and in, in, invites us into a channel that tells us where that exists, should we need it, right? Yes. It's not automatic. Yes, our system. Yeah. No, our system is very reactive. It's not proactive. Yeah, and it, and it makes sense. requires mm-hmm. you to figure it out in a nebulous system mm-hmm. and then initiate it yourself while you're not well. So we, mm-hmm. we just leave it with you. Right. And so, yeah, I, what a difference that would make if the way in which we set our systems up came from that framework, assuming responsibility and then communicating and articulating that to the people who need it at the front end of things, not when it's deep, when they're deep and they feel lost. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we yes. also know that relationship but- and connection is so important for mitigating trauma. We can go through Mm -hmm. hard things if we're with people. It's not traumatizing in the same way as if we're seen and understood and have a way of relating during the hard thing. But when you describe all these new experiences that we count on being with a person, and then that person's not allowed in the room with us and something goes sideways, that becomes traumatizing. And so now we have a whole new level of mental health stuff that we hope to prevent that we didn't or couldn't. And now we have a whole wave of this, what I, we call now the shadow pandemic of, oh, yes. you know, the numbers will go down. Looks like we're in the en- endemic phase entering. That is not true for the outcome for our mental health. Now we have a whole new curve bell curve. We're going to watch it's on the rise Yes, and it is yet to peak. Yes. Well, I think as we talk about our physical wellness, we already know that our mental health affects translates to our physical health. What we think translates to how we feel. So you can't keep telling us, we'll just go for a walk. And just, if I walk up with my, from my door, like someone had said, well, you know, self-care, just go for a walk. I'm like, that's great. But see my brain, it's still in here whether I'm inside or outside. So if I don't, I my, bring myself my me. mindset. That's right. Right. I can't leave this behind. No. So if, if I don't change my mindset, what's going to happen here inside is not going to change. Yeah. And I think it's so important. I would love to be mental health care, be more focused on and mainstream. It's not, not normal anymore. Like it, people, remember we're trying to end the stigma. I think we're, we're well mm-hmm. beyond that a little bit. Mm-hmm. And we're kind of in like, now, what do we do? And mm-hmm. what does it look like? And there's so many people that have this and that. And how do we kind of work with all of it? And we're going to yeah. see it, as you said, it's going to be a huge wave. And not only that, we have no idea what this has never happened to children before. That's right. Right. Like you have, it's new. I, I can't stand it. When, yes. And I hate it when people say, oh, well, you have a, you know, have, you have a COVID baby. So that's why she's shy or that's why she's timid. Mm-hmm. And it, it bothers me because the work we do at home and the life we try to up for her during her first year and a half of life, it, she has no idea we're in a pandemic. This is all no, oblivious. normal. This is to normal her. to her. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. My five-year-old, however, is like, she definitely she knew how it. it was. There's grief. Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm. Yeah. So I think, and then that, again, some moms come back to, well, great. I have to figure out mm. in my gentle parenting. Mm-hmm. Don't forget gentle parenting is a thing now mm-hmm. and <laughs> at which I'm all for, but it's like, there's always something we have to do. There's yeah. always more we have to do. And if you don't, your kids will suffer. 
Yeah. And in your mind, you'll be up all night thinking, oh my God, I have a COVID baby. And, and maybe that's why she's, she's so quiet. And that would run through my mind at night. Or maybe that's why she's not as happy as uh, other child. Yeah. And I'm like, forget that. Like she could just, that could just be her personality and that's okay. Yeah. And I have the rest of her life to help her work through these things. Yeah. And that's okay. Hmm. I, so, yeah. yeah. It's so, the messaging is just so powerful in either direction. It's so important and, and to have a sounding board for new moms, because if you are insular, you're stuck in your own cycles. Anxiety does that anyway. So that's, that's not you. That's an illness talking. It will ruminate and it will fester for you. That's not your fault. You've got that on top of the natural worries you're going to have when you're parenting, particularly for the first time, and then in a new situation mm. where it's unpredictable and nobody really knows the terrain or what to make of it. So everybody's guessing, everybody's got their theories, they're spouting off what's going to happen to you and why, like you mentioned, you've got a COVID baby, therefore dot, 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 maybe, maybe not. Yes. Right. And we don't <laughs> know, but talk about something anxiety would want to latch onto. That's a Yes. That's like the perfect oh, yes. storm. And, and we yes. don't have somebody to remind us that there are other perspectives because we're isolated. So I'm yes. stuck in my own bedroom 24 seven with my own thoughts and my Instagram feed. Yes. Scary place. Terrifying. Scary place. That's a mm -hmm. danger zone. That is a danger zone. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I just... It makes me really sad because I, my daughter is going to be six this year. Mm -hmm. And to think that nothing has changed mm -hmm. and to th just talking about that experience, um, my mental health journey and po uh, postpartum depression, it was, it was awful. Mm -hmm. And to, to just, just to think I probably wouldn't be here if I hadn't accidentally found someone that said, Oh, I can help you. And, oh. and she, she just looked at me and said, Oh, Oh no, no, this is what's going on with you. And, and we need to get you help. Oh. And I saw so many other people, right? You see, yeah. I saw, I saw my family and I just, I was this ghost, just this shell of myself floating through and, and mm. just hoping that I look like a good mom this baby right and my feeding it right I don't know and just and and right my partner had no idea because I got the big binder and he got the little pamphlet but if he yeah. had got right the signs and symptoms of hey yeah. maybe you should look for this yeah that might help because now I'm having to try all out of my fear and anxiety and just kind of say, hey I'm not well I'm yeah. not really sure what's happening right now, but I'm not well. And when I first said that, the fear on his face was devastating because it just showed me that I didn't know what I was doing and yeah. he didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. And that was so, I don't know, it's why it needs to start as a team together. It doesn't have to be just a partner, but even if it's just that mm. person that's in Another your Another pair of eyes. Yeah. Yes. Knowing eyes. Something. Yes. And I could go on about that, but yeah. I just, I, I just feel like so many of things that I went through looking back now, I could have been, I didn't have to get down that low Yeah. because there were things it was preventable that in a lot of ways. Oh yeah. Yeah. When mental health care feels like a fluke that you got it, that's a problem. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. If you were to offer listeners three important tips or messages that you have mm. come to know for new parents, what would be on your hit list? What are the, like, what are the things that you want new parents to know? I would say never stop self-advocating. There's nothing wrong with asking too many questions. There's nothing wrong with not asking questions. There's yes. nothing wrong with, you know, inserting yourself 
and saying, this doesn't feel right for me. I'm sure it says this in your little medical book or journal, but to me, this doesn't feel right. Good. Or speaking up and, and saying, I know just for me having my first, I felt very, um, everyone had a lot of opinions and I felt uncomfortable telling other people, oh, well, you know, ugh, like ugh, it feels uncomfortable. Don't yeah. ever feel uncomfortable. Say what you need to say. And that's going to make you feel good. And that's going to make you feel confident in what you are doing. Okay. Um, let's say trust your gut. That also goes mm. with, with my first seven, right? Yes. Your like intuition. You get, yes. And it's a, it's just, it's something I don't know what it is. Maybe it just comes when baby comes, this intuition mm -hmm. of, it's just this connection you have with them, right? They touch your skin and they know it's you. You talk to them and they, they know that voice. They've heard it before mm -hmm. when they were inside you. So the connection there is very, very strong. Mm -hmm. So I feel like when something doesn't feel right for you, that's going to translate to baby and to trust your gut. There's so much research out there. There's so many things you should be doing. This swaddle or that swaddle, yeah, this crib goodness. or this stroller, yeah. right? It's, it's what feels good for you inside is what's going to be best for you, period. Mm -hmm. whether, whether it's mainstream or not, you choose your own path and you be confident in those decisions. And when a, when a baby is born, a mother is born. I was never a mom mm -hmm. before I had Olivia. And when I had Olivia, my first thought when they put her chest was, wow, she's heavy. <laughs> it, and I, I, and I, I'll never forget it. Cause I thought, oh, wow. And I, I was holding uh, her and all of a sudden was expecting to feel like, oh, I'm a mom. Mm. So serene. And there's doves in the air and there's butterflies <laughs> somewhere, yes. you know, Sparkle. and we have this connection. Yes. Oh, Oh, just should be magic. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I just born into being a mom. So I, I yes, I gave birth to baby, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean I'm instantly a no. mom. Yeah. I don't know how to do it. So they're having all of these leaps and learning all these milestones and they have all of these growing pains. Yeah. So do we. So are you. And that's okay. Yes. 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 Permission. Yes. <sighs> Yes. You're growing too. Yeah. Everyone's growing into this and there's time. There's time to grow into this. Yes. Right. Yes. They grow slow on purpose. And I think it's a gift to us that they grow slow. It gives us time to figure ourselves out and figure them out and the in yes. between. Yeah. Yes. Well, I was thinking the other day is they always say, um, cherish these moments because they'll be gone. <laughs> And I'm like, that sounds like guilt. <laughs> that sounds awful to me. Oh, and goodness. that's not very fair because you're saying if I'm not present, I'm not happy. I'm not momming of the year uh -huh. single you're day it up. while my child is growing. I'm a mess. Uh -huh. But yep. I, I thought about it and I said, my mom, everything she could, my mom is, I love that woman. She is my superhero. She is the best. Yeah. I don't remember not, I don't remember the embraces that we had when I was a baby, obviously. Yeah. I don't remember what she was like on my first day to school, really. I don't. But what I love most now is when my mom hugs me and I hug her back, I'm mm -hmm. there for it. And she's there for it. And we can both remember it. And it feels so good. And that connection is so mm -hmm. great. So even though she, maybe, maybe she, you know, forgot to pack my leg one day or we missed the bus or something, or yeah. she was angry at me for something or just stressed little and maybe missed a day of giving me a hug. I don't know. She would feel yeah. bad about that because she's supposed yeah, to. Yeah. I've wrecked my every... kid. Ooh, right? I wrecked my kid. Oh, that's so common. It's yes. the distress felt. I get that in the office all the time. The mom yes. guilt. And I, I step back and I say, I'm physically going to step away from you because I'm going to show you that I'm looking at the big picture in the big mm. picture. I see you every day show up as an amazing, attentive, attuned mom. And then you yes. come in and pay me to tell me 
right? This is how much it matters to you and how terrified you are that you have ruined your baby because you left their comfort items at home for a day while they went to school. And then they had to call home at lunch with dysregulated emotion. Yeah, they did. Cause that's normal for a kid when they don't have the thing in the moment, because they don't know how to wait for things that doesn't make you a yes. bad mom and you have not traumatized them and they will not be ruined or hate you when you pick them up at three. Yes. Yes. If but you're we need not to start defined by that. the moment. Yes. We need to start believing those yeah, things, right? Do. There's so many mom quotes and you hear it and you're like, yes, mom's first, you know, put your, your oxygen on first mom. Mm-hmm. But if you don't actually believe it, you, it won't happen. You won't live it. You need to actually believe in those things. And remember that the hugs I have with my mom now are the best hugs I'll ever have. Yeah. And I'll remember them. And I don't remember the ones I did or did That's not right. have That's as right. an infant. And you're just, I know you're just supposed to do your best, but I think if, if you're, if you're waking up every day and thinking, what can I do for myself today? Or how can I flow through this day? That's best for me. That feels good for me. Mm-hmm. That will go through you and to the rest right. of your family. And it will happen whether you ask it to or want it to or not, because you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, you know, everyone in the house is, oh, on yeah. eggshells, right? That's right? It doesn't happen on purpose. It's a feeling. So if you think about your feelings first, everyone else is going to feel that too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I love this conversation. Love it. Chills. And when you say that phrase, I had the chills when you wrote it down and sent it to me too. When a baby is born, a mother is born. Yes. Preach. This is so yes. good. Yes, it is so <laughs> true. And I, I am so grateful for everything you shared today, personally, professionally, and the hope that you give us because you both named the reality. You didn't skip that. It's so mm. validating for people to hear this. And where do we go from here? I'm going to put a bunch of your resources in the show notes. Please, people who are listening, go check it out because it's so important that we continue the work for ourselves, for our families, and for our systems of care, because we are those systems of care we influence. So be your own advocate and advocate for one another. And I'm so grateful for everybody who showed up for this conversation and everybody who's sharing it and for you to come and deliver. Thank you. Thanks, Candace. <laughs> Thank you so much, me, Karen. I love this conversation. I hope to be back. Okay, we'll do another one. Okay. <laughs>